Hi, you're with Julian on the Brown Note and a review of David Bowie's album from 1977, Heroes. And it's part of a new feature of Perfect Tens, albums that are completely perfect, genius from start to finish. For me, uh, in the modern era, a lot of the acclaim for the greatest artistic achievement of David Bowie's life is the preceding album, Low, also a flat 10. I think that Heroes is a better album. I do get why Low would be rated higher because it came first by not even close to a year. These albums were back to back. And in a way, they're the same album remade twice. Which, But Low is a minimalist album and Heroes is a maximalist version of Low. And Lowe is famous for the fragmentary nature of the rock side of the album, where songs are built out of song fragments and very abstract and very challenging and art house in the way they're presented, disappearing as soon as they've arrived, before a suite of three instrumentals uh, pans the album out, actually four instrumentals. And that's broadly what happens with Heroes, is except it's maximalist, and the best example of that is a track on, and, and the, the song listing on both albums is analogous to each other. And it's the um, track Sound and Vision, I think is the third track on Low. And has a similar sort of vibe to the third track on Heroes, which is Heroes. And one of them goes on for six minutes and is one of the most acclaimed out, uh, songs of all time. Um, Sound of Vision is a magnificent, perfect song, but are you really going to say it's not more satisfying to have the Heroes version of that ethos? So it's famously part of David Bowie's Berlin trilogy where he made an incredible fuss of critics and the public from pretty much um, Ziggy Stardust and the run of albums, probably Hunky Dory, Aladdin Sane, Diamond Dogs, uh, Station Station and Young Americans before um, descending into cocaine madness and overdosing apparently 20 times and fleeing an LA that was in the mid 70s apparently one of the most hellish places on earth if you were part of that world with his compatriot Iggy Pop and David Bowie had alighted in the States and amazingly produced Lou Reed's Post Velvet Underground album Transformer and um, Iggy Pop, the uh, final Iggy Pop and the Stooges album, um, Raw Power. And he'd become friends with Iggy Pop and they were both in, uh, I guess Iggy Pop was in the heroin world and, and Bowie was in I Have One Glass of Milk A Day and A Lot Of Cocaine. And they, the, the, the legend is they fled to Berlin and made three albums with Brian Eno. Uh, the British art rock titan from Roxy Music a few uh, years earlier. And uh, these were art house mastheads that only got appreciated over time. I, I don't buy the Berlin Trilogy theory. And the reason is this, is that I think that logic... So there's Low, 1976. Uh, there's uh, Heroes, <laughs> this album, in 77. And Lodger, 79. The reason I don't buy the Berlin Trilogy is that Logic is for me, alongside Young Americans and probably Pinups, the worst David Bowie album of his great period. It is There is nothing that revisionism would do to that album to make it good. Scary Monsters that came after that is brilliant, but Logic is rubbish. Uh, it is a, You'll always get people saying that the least liked art by an artist is the best thing they've ever done. It's not. And there's a, the other reason is there's a gap. So what happened is they actually went to France. They had uh, recording time in a, a chateau in France. And then they um, moved to Berlin, right near the Berlin Wall. And made these three albums. But that's not what happened. Because there was a gap of about a year and a half where they'd finished Heroes and went to America. He toured as Iggy Pop's um, keyboardist for a while. And then they all reconvened back in Germany in these famous studios 
but it's not true that you know there was a gap here what i think is truest is there's a quadrilogy a berlin quadrilogy because at the same time that low and heroes were being made by bowie the two best Iggy Pop solo albums were being made at the same time, often with the same people. So we get um, Nightclubbing. No, we get The Idiot, sorry. The track Nightclubbing is on the album The Idiot. Being made virtually the same time Low is being made. And then we get Lust for Life being made virtually the same time Heroes is being made. Four of the greatest albums of all time, all being made largely around the same collective of musicians, largely around those studios in Berlin and also the Chateau in France. So I think that there's actually a Berlin quadrilogy and I would rub Tenant out of that Tenant. I call it Tenant every time. Lodger. <laughs> um, the album itself is an absolute, and, or there's a trilogy which is Brian Eno's Another Green World, another 10 out of 10 album, and Low and Heroes. Another Green World also pushed the boundaries of art rock and electronica with a midsection that bled over into instrumental tracks uh, and Eno's work so Tony Visconti um, produced a lot of David Bowie's albums and he produced Low, he produced Heroes and for a long time there was this urban myth that Brian Eno produced those albums that were his babies and that was really unfair on Tony Visconti because Visconti was one of the most forward-thinking people involved in these records. The most famous production quirk on any of this stuff is the drum sound in low being one of the most imitated drum sounds in music history and, and variants on it dominating the charts in the 80s, this very gated drum sound, which was a total result of Tony Visconti's work. And Eno wasn't on all of the tracks. He was intermittently involved. Um, so I thought that was quite unfair. Um, have I got a list of who's involved? Personnel. So on low we had Carlos Alomar. The, the musicians on these Bowie albums, particularly sort of around the station to station, low, heroes era, really don't get their just desserts. Carlos Alomar on rhythm guitar, George Murray on bass guitar, and Dennis Davis on drums and percussion. Davis is a phenomenal, listen to any of the drumming on low. It is phenomenal, and here on Heroes. And Visconti is a producer with um, Brian Eno um, picking up synthesizers and keyboards. The one genius addition to that being on low was the addition of King Crimson's Robert Fripp, who came in allegedly in a six hour burst and guitar wanked all over the whole album to unbelievable effect a lot of the stuff you hear on heroes the track is robert fripp and robert fripp had also done amazing work on another green world with brian eno before that so he was no stranger to this this whole ethos i'll see if i can get the um hansa studio the hansa studio in west berlin which is right near the berlin wall and of course the track heroes is allegedly bowie watching producer tony visconti share a kiss with a a local woman that had become romantically involved with him right next to the Berlin Wall and inspiring this labyrinth world. Um, it's a, it's, it's, it, I think Low in its own way is a surprisingly rock and funky album. But I would say that the opening salvo on Heroes is, e, is actually even more muscular. Beauty and the Beast and Joe the Lion I think if um, Low takes what a normal rock song is, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, chorus, coda, and just completely fragments that down to very short songs that seem to occupy all of the elements in different orders, I think with um, Beauty and the Beast and Joe the Lion, very, two very muscular rock funk tracks that um, open the album, it's almost like he's zeroed in on the coda alone for those songs. They appear fully fired up and fully fleshed out, like they're slow boning out from the moment they go on. They're two terrific tracks. But one thing I do like about that is that once you get to the end of Joe the Lion, which has got, which is just phenomenal. I mean, Beauty and the, uh, Beauty and the Beast is a terrific track. Joe the Lion is one of the most underappreciated Bowie tracks. It's magnificent. A lot of this album has incredibly complicated verse structures 
from Bowie. And I would say, arguably up there with the best vocal takes on any Bowie album. Not the best, because he's done that quite a lot, but the equal. Uh, some of it is really, really impassioned, bellowing singing. But um, the a lot of the verse structures are so weird and, and art house and avant-garde before launching into um, much more sort of traditionally satisfying uh, choruses. And this, they're really noisy tracks as well. They're not pleasant to listen to. They beat you over the head. It's quite a way to open an album. I think Low is a lot more sedate, even though it's avant-garde, it's a lot more sedate in its introduction. These just like break the door down. Um, but one thing I like is that when Joe the Lion, and both these songs feel like codas, once it's ending, we then get the full form six minute song gently, surprisingly gently shuffling into focus, which is the track Heroes. And I, that's something you never got on low. You never got that sort of counterpoint between these two very sort of abridged noise fests and then this full blown start to finish uh, long form song. Nothing on low that is sung lasts more than three minutes, and this lasts six minutes. So you're already in a different emotional world here, and it's soaring, and it will, you know, it's it's almost a bit stairway to heavenly because it's hard to avoid how famous that song is. But it's amazing, and I feel like from then on we go through this incredible run through the midsection, where low starts to peter down towards these vast instrumentals. Uh, here we get Sons of the Silent Age, which was, I think, going to be the um, centerpiece of the album and the title track of the album, before obviously Heroes came along and everyone went, that's a pretty good song actually. Sons of the Silent Age has amazingly verbose, odd verses married to this absolutely soaring chorus that could almost be an R&B song, even though it's treated very differently, but the chorus is, a, is absolutely incredible on it. I feel the production here is um, deliberately less intense and interlocked than low. Uh, a lot of the songs spread out and have this vast soundstage. Um, Blackout possibly less interesting than the two tracks that preceded it, which is fair enough. I think another high point is V2 Schneider, named after Florian Schneider from the band Craftwork. That is just stunning. It doesn't rely on any sort of, um, it's got vocals, but no, no verses. It's, it's just treated vocals in the background. It's really an instrumental track, uh, which again pushes the instrumental tracks out to four, not three, which is something that you can also do with low as well. I think there's a, a rock instrumental before it gets into Warsaw and the, and the more famous deep instrumentals. From there on we get Sense of Doubt, Moss Garden and New Cone, which are three beautiful instrumentals. I think the ones on low are more iconic, certainly Warsaw, you know, it feels very, very heavy. But I think the instrumentals on Heroes flow better together as an album. I think that the, the come down from Blackout through V2 Schneider into Sense of Doubt works better. It doesn't feel like someone's put those songs in as a massive counterpoint to what's going on on the album. Moss Garden is one of the most beautiful, atmospheric, ambient instrumental tracks of all time. I sure, I'm sure that they wanted to call it Japanese Garden, but felt like it was too trite. There isn't anything else you think of while listening to it. It's beautifully constructed. It's got minimal elements, but every element adds to the soundstage. There's this barely um, heard synth that seesaws in the background all the way through over these sort of Japanese instrumentations. It's a magical piece of music. I even heard it on um, the Trendy Kids local radio, this guy that plays like ambient stuff. I was going, God, is that off of Heroes? And it was. Um, and that all sort of comes down to New Colon. And the other big thing about Heroes is that low ends into the abyss off of the back of those three instrumentals and some people have criticized heroes for roaring back into life at this stage i don't i really like that fact <clears throat> i think low can feel you leaving quite despondent because it's one of the most depressing albums of all time deliberately but this one roars back into life with this amazing clubby track the secret life of arabia and maybe it doesn't have any business being there but it leaves you 
leaving the album on a much higher point emotionally for me. And one thing I've never understood is there's only two tracks that I can think of that sound like this. There's this one, The Secret Life of Arabia, and then there's uh, Hit Me With Your Rhythm Stick. They both have this unknowably shuffling rhythm and they both came out about a month apart and I've never heard anyone compare them. So I don't know what's going on there because it's such a weird sound. But it's a great way to end the album and it also points towards the Bowie of the 80s as well. So I think that Heroes is a perfect piece of music. I've gone through my Bowie stages over and over and over and eventually reordered everything to be in the order it is now. And I really think, for me, Heroes is the best David Bowie album, followed by um, Ziggy Stardust, followed by Low, controversially followed by Aladdin Sane, I think the most underappreciated of that golden run of albums, and better than Hunky Dory. And I would follow that by um, probably Black Star, probably Hunky Dory, and then Scary Monsters as seven absolute masterpieces. But Heroes, a flat 10 out of 10.